Yeah, so we're uh, about to get started with our next conversation of the day. And we are going to bring on another artist that both Tommy and myself have worked closely with. Um, and I'm so pleased to welcome Morshan Alahari. Uh, Morshan is an Iranian Kurdish media artist, activist, and writer based in Brooklyn, New York. Morshan Alahari is an activist who uses computer modeling, 3D scanning, and digital fabrication techniques to explore the intersection of art and activism, inspired by concepts of collective archiving and cultural contradiction. Alahari's 3D printed sculptures and videos challenge social and gender norms. She wants her work to respond to, resist, and criticize the current political and cultural situation that is experienced on a daily basis. Her work has been part of numerous exhibitions, festivals, and workshops at venues throughout the world. Some of them are New Museum MoMA, Centro Pompidou, Venice Biennale di Architectura, and the Museum for Agenvante Kunst, among many others. She's also the recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant and the Sun Sundance Institute New Frontier International Fellowship and the Leading Global Thinkers of 2016 awarded by Foreign Policy Magazine. Her 3D additivist manifesto video is in the collection of SF MoMA, and recently she has been awarded major commissions by The Shed, Rhizome, New Museum, Whitney Museum of American Art, Liverpool Biennial, and FACT. And we're actually going to see a presentation now from within one of those commissions, which I just mentioned. Uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art commissioned a hypertext narrative for their art port, um, and Morshin used that as a way to present work in her series, She Who Sees the Unknown, and the figure, which you will see in this performance as we're about to start, is called The Laughing Snake. And we're going to play the performance for you now, and we'll be in conversation afterwards. Enjoy. She who saw all things in a broad born earth and beyond, and knew what was to be known. She who had seen what there was, and had embraced the otherness. She to whom the image clung like a mirror, a display of crisis, and who dwelt together with a devised becoming. She knows and sees the unknown, and lays them bare. She is the monstrous other, the dark goddess, the possessive djinn, the dividing persona. She restores myth and histories, the untold and the forgotten, the misread and uneven, those off and from the Near East. She's the laughing snake, known as the one mirrored. She's daughter to no warrior, wife to no nobleman, mother to no hero. She stands rootless, yet rooted. The one displays the same elsewhere. She's the destroyer of all occupiers, the killer of the people of no sky, capturing those with wings who do not fly, putting out every fire in favor of her own flame. Her stories told at every edge of the world, a djinn no one could elude. One time into the past and one time into the future they prayed, you have created this monster, now give her her equal. But no equal was found to fight her. All eyes on her, they held a mirror in front of her, when she saw her reflection, she burst into laughter. She laughed for days and nights until she died. I am 12 at school, and in our theology class, our teacher tells us that if we keep on not covering our hair completely under the scarf, on the last judgment day, God will hang us from each strand of our hair. And I have one of those disobedient heads with all my hair out. I raise my hand to say, I don't want to pray to a God that is that cruel. And I will get suspended from school for two days. 
And somehow for months and years since then, I keep imagining a scene where God is that caterpillar in Alice in the Wonderland. And it's the last judgment day, and I'm hung from every single strand of my hair. And God says, explain yourself. And I laugh hysterically to say, I'm afraid I can't explain myself because I'm not myself, sir. Every once in a while, we felt brave enough to let the wind blow through our hair, which would cause an arrest, maybe some hours of jail, maybe getting harassed or beaten by the moral police. But we still did it, and the universe made an example of us for being this faithful to its elements. I'm six in Tehran. My grandmother catches me rubbing my vagina on the sofa warm arm, on the pillow, on the sole of my foot, on the edge of a bench in a public park, on the steepest part of a rock at the Caspian Sea, on my doll's head on the plane under the blanket. And she tells me if I keep doing this, a snake will come out of my vagina. I do it more and more and more. And every time I do it and there's no snake, I know this is yet another victory over a world I keep at distance. One day I discovered that in English, the word virginity can be used both for men and women. In Farsi, it's only used for women and the loss of hymen. Some women would get hymen repair and surgery before marriage so that they would bleed when they have sex with their husband for the first time. I lost my virginity at the age of 15. No shame. I do not regret. No shame. No regret. No shame. No regret. All eyes on her, they held a mirror in front of her. When she saw her reflection within the world, she burst into laughter from the image, them holding a mirror. She laughed hysterically for days and nights until she died. And I will be standing on a stage and there will be a ceremony and I'll be raising my head and I will see a lineup of hundreds, thousands, millions of girls and they will each hold a safety pin up to the air and one girl will come forward to give me my own and she will whisper into my ear, carry this with you everywhere you go and this will become the weapon of my generation and in Farsi we call safety pin Sanja Qofli which translates to locking, securing pin and years later, when I learn the word in English, and I won't stop thinking about the uncanny coincidence of words and objects, and our stories we were too ashamed to share. And years later, from this future, none of this will even be a thing. And won't this be our revolution? 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 Laugh at the revolution unless it's our revolution. I am 16, I am 17, I am 18, I am 19, I am 20, I am 21, I am 22. And please know that I am just existing, walking around in the streets of Tehran,
taking the public taxi, standing in some line, taking the bus, sitting down somewhere, and young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually. Cat call me every single day to tell me what a nice piece of pussy I am, to tell me I want to fuck you and your mother, to tell me you look like a whore with that makeup, to tell me I can put my dick inside your ass if you want to stay a virgin. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually. Touch my lap and my breasts and my ass. Rub their penis on me in some crowded place, follow me for blocks at night, forcing me to get their number. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually. Ask for directions and show their penis in the car before driving off laughing. Walk to me and whisper, if you waited right here at the bus station, I will come pick I will come back to pick you up after dropping my daughter. He points out to his daughter sitting in the car and she's my age. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually. Make it to my nightmares, my subconscious, somewhere deep in my soul. And young boys, middle-aged fathers, old, old grandpas, casually repeat into each other. And they will hold a mirror in front of me, in front of her. And I, she, will lock a safety pin to my hair collar. And I, she, will laugh while tears run down my hair face. And I, she, will immediately recall my her grandmother saying, to befriend or conquer a jinn, always have a safety pin fastened to your clothes. And at that very moment, so many worlds will collapse, and the laughing snake and I will become one. And we will be mirrored, mirroring, and we will appear to recede into an infinite distance, that is, the future. And won't we celebrate this diffracted future? 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 Laugh at the future unless it's our future. And I will walk out and I will be on the bus and he will sit next to me and he will slowly start rubbing his elbow to my left breast and he will look out the window like nothing is happening while doing it. And I will take my safety pin out and I will calmly push it into his leg and I will push it in and I will push it in so much and so hard and so fiercely and, w and, and the more I push it in the more his body falls apart. And the more I push it in, the more he will disappear. And the whole world will be watching, and he will be gone, and I will return to my body. And won't she turn around her image? 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 Turn around her image? Laugh at the image, unless it's our image. Oh, we're on air. Thank you so much, Morshin. We're here with Morshin Alamari. Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. I mean, it's um, maybe was it the first time that you were performing with a website? Was that the first time? Yeah, you were doing I, that? 
I, yeah, I've performed like a little bit here and there during like some of my lectures, but more of like, as I'm giving my lecture, but, and then I actually did something for Pioneer Works recently where um, they, I did like um, another version of this at my studio, but this is definitely the first time that I'm doing it on a stage more as a performance uh, that has that projection in the background and I'm like um, actually you know, going through the website, putting on different words um, to perform it, so yeah. Yeah, thank yes, you. Yes. So, that, so that video um, is also available on at pioneerworks.org slash broadcast. I think it, we launched it, I don't know when we launched it, Morrison. I know it's been like a really difficult, it's been, it's been challenging to figure out actually when that thing is gonna get launched. I think it's out, I think it's out. We're posted about it today. And if you're interested in hearing more about the concepts in the video, you know, that's a, a good place to kind of see them archived. So. Yeah, and just some um, background for anyone who might have joined in the middle of the stream. Um, that was Morishan Alahari presenting uh, a reading live in front of her hypertext narrative, which was a commission from the Whitney Museum of American Art. And it is online at the Whitney Museum's website in their Artport Commission section. So we encourage you all to go spend some time with that simulation as well and click through and explore your own narrative. Um, and it was really special to see you, Morrison, actually there inside the gray area theater with that simulation, being inside the simulation for radical simulation. Um, so I really appreciate you doing that. And maybe like to, if you can start off just by talking about some of the choices you were making during the performance, like did you have that path ahead of time or what was that sort of click through like for you as you were performing? Um, yeah, I kind of like sat down and like created um, like a little bit of a pattern to kind of follow because there were sections that I found like more interesting or important for me to read. And as you mentioned, this is um, a kind of hypertext, multi-choice, um, non-linear story. So what I presented was um, perhaps around like 80% of it. And so there's definitely more to explore and there's sections that I didn't go through. Um, um, but yeah, I kind of made a little bit of purposeful decision of like which path to take. Um. Yeah, thanks a lot for sharing that with us. The, you know, thematically, it's really, you know, difficult. There, there are parts of it that are really difficult, difficult to hear, to listen to. Um, dealing with really kind of like challenging subject matter, um, really traumatic stuff. Um, there's a point in the at the end of the piece where, you know, some of it seems like um, real uh, kind of diuretic things that that happen to women on a on a on a daily basis um and then then there's this point at the end that seems kind of like um a surreal kind of like a uh, resolution of to this problem where you push your your pin inside of this person this man's leg and they and they dissolve and disappear this is kind of like this will be a long rant and and you know trauma itself seems like a um and uh, ancestral trauma seems to be like a large theme in a lot of your works. Uh, do you see these pieces as ways to, you know, resolve those things or, you know, maybe just start a conversation for them? How are you thinking about this work in relation to trauma? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, when actually I started working on this piece uh, at the same time that I started my residency at Pioneer Works uh, two summers ago, and that was also around the time that Whitney uh, Museum of American Art had given me uh, this commission uh, curated by uh, Christian Paul, um, and they, you know, gave me the, the kind of like space and, and funding to work on this piece as well. Um, and so writing it was very challenging because I'm talking about some stuff that I've actually never like talked about, never written about, um, talking about, you know, like when, when the time I lost my virginity or like my, my, my like sexual desire at the same time, getting to know my, my body. So I was also very nervous about writing about this stuff because um, it's still, you know, a big taboo to talk about those things you know, within like the Iranian society. Um, 
obviously with my family, I kind of like, I, I told my mom I'm writing this piece and I'm working on this piece and this is what it's about. Um, so they are open about it, but um, it was hard to kind of like write about that from, from that side of it, like it's a society that is gonna like be there to like ready for that stuff, but also um, when the Me Too campaign stuff was happening in the US, when it started, um, I felt like it was very much focused on the issues of um, mostly like Western, dominantly like white women, and, and those were the voices that were mostly like amplified, which, you know, was, was, was great in some way because it started a movement and then we needed those voices. Um, but I, I realized like how women from different countries and different backgrounds and different races like are really haven't like been given perhaps a platform where their voice hasn't been amplified in the same way. So um, working on this work, uh, body of work with the with the unknown series um, and then the laughing snake is one of the figures of it. Um, I kind of felt like this was an opportunity to talk about, you know, my experiences and then this collective experience of like women in Iran and growing up in Iran and um, all these like really complex relationships between your body and sexuality and sexual desire and then like, being in, in this like very like violently patriarchal spaces where you know, purposefully, I'm choosing like really like exact words that you would be told like walking around. Like, I'm not exaggerating this at all. Like it's just like that common to just say those words to you as you like walk around in the streets, and that's your like daily life experience. The story of the man coming to me, telling me to that he's gonna give me a ride if I like wait for her after he drops his daughter off. And that's real, you know. Um, so I use it as an opportunity to talk about these issues to hopefully talk about our experiences in some way and yeah as you say like perhaps through that process find some path for healing um and in a in a personal way yeah thanks thanks for that i was curious um i have something here that i want to <laughs> This was a this was a gift you left when you um, left the residency at Pioneer Works, and it makes an appearance in your video. This thing, yeah, or the mask it, I'm wearing. The mask you're wearing. Can you tell us about the mask that you're wearing? Yeah, well, this one that I left at Pioneer Work was a version of it for a performance with these, which has like the signs that are for um, this method called Ram Mondi or Ilme Ram, which, which is, a, is in Arabic and it's like, and it's, it's basically the signs of sand, which is used for people to um, as, you know, this kind of like practice in, 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 the, in the Arab world. Um, and uh, I, that one has both like signs and, and figures, like top and line. But the one that I'm wearing for this performance um, is another version of very, I have a talisman, uh, which is a talisman for the ruling power. Um, so when I did that performance, you know, I'm kind of like switching the mask. Um, and uh, it's so weird, like also talking about masks. And every time I say mask now, it's like something else comes to my, my head. Mm -hmm. um, Different masks. I also really want to use the idea of the mirror. Maybe I should say a little bit about the laughing snake because I don't think like we actually like I, I haven't had a chance to contextualize like this work in terms of like what is the snake, what is the laughing snake, what is the visuals. Um, would that be okay? Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, and then I come back onto the mirror and the mask from there. Um, so I, uh, this She Was Is Young series is a work that I've been working on for three and a half years. It's almost done. I'm just working on releasing an archive as the last part of it now. Um, but the work itself focuses on um, monstrous uh, female slash genderless uh, figures from ancient uh uh, Middle Eastern uh, stories that um, also are from mostly the Islamic era. 
And uh, the laughing snake is one of the fears that I focus on. And I came across her illustrations in a book called Kitab al-Bulhan or the Book of Wonders. And then I searched for her story and her story is that she's, you know, this snake in the form of a djinn or like a monster that is going through different towns and cities and eating all these animals and killing all the people and winning all these battles and no one can do anything uh, about it. Um, and until some man comes out of a cave, some old man, and says that the only way to kill her is to hold a mirror in front of her. And the story of holding a mirror in front of um, any kind of powerful monstrous figure, you know, is also known uh, through other like Western um, stories, of course. Like to, so, the la that that aspect of holding a mirror um, is kind of like a common story. But um, what happens is that is Medusa turned into stone. But with, in the case of the laughing snake, when she sees a mirror in front of her, she starts laughing from seeing her reflection. And she laughs for days and nights until she um, basically dies from laughter, self-destructs from laughter. And in the tradition of this body of work, she will see the unknown. For me, reading these stories and getting to know these stories, it's also been about how do I turn around these power structures, right? Like thinking about the man holding the mirror and her death, not as a position of weakness, the laughter is not a position of weakness, but rather a, a position of empowerment. Um, so as she laughs and self-destructs, she take over this uh, ownership, back with this ownership of her body and the reflection of her body. Um, so obviously the mirror becomes a very important um, symbol here, something that I want to play with with the performance you know as i'm performing you also see it kind of like reflecting um and um also it becomes something that i keep like going back to in the text so that's a little bit of a context about the the laughter and i also use laughing as you know like a what like a word that i keep coming back to um for ways of like again finding power within different contexts within different situations you mentioned a few things in there that I would love to talk about. I want to get into your research-based practice because I know that's also a big part of what you're working on now. But before that, you know, this idea of dystopia and monstrosity in your work um, and thinking about like monstrosity as an alternative to whiteness. Can you talk about like a little bit how you use those concepts as sort of a way to reclaim these narratives in your practice? Yeah, I mean, there's a long history of uh, you know, feminism and feminist movements within like thinking about the figure of the monster, within thinking about the the figure of, um, you know, um, also kind of the witch. Um, so these these figures, which are like historically, you know, whenever it's about like connected to like women, known as always like negative or like, um, you know, a, a witchy woman or person or whatever. Um, so like, as, as something that is like bad or negative or scary. And then through different movements and like, again, as I said, like feminist movements specifically, uh, there has been practices of like thinking about recontextualizing these things and like thinking about, again, the position of monstrosity as a position that is not, not negative. And, and, and even if it's negative in that context, we can use it as a way to claim or reclaim something. Um, so, Within this, I've been very actually focused on the figure of the djinn, um, or, you know, as some people might know it, genie. Um, but the djinn also is this figure, is this creature that um, has, you know, a, a really big influence within Islamic cultures. It's talked about in the Quran as a creature that is made of smokeless fire that can make decisions um, like a human. So it can be your friend or your enemy, it, it has a will. Um, and so for me, it was also really important to kind of like come up with some kind of, you know, this thing that I talk about the refiguration and refiguring of not just figures from the past for another a reimagination of other uh, possibilities of now and the future, but also refiguring this image of, um, the the cyborg as Donna Haraway puts it or the monster or the witch again within this very like western context um 
And I felt like there's so much room into like thinking about jinn as something that is very specific to Islamic culture, but really hasn't been explored in any of these movements or, uh, you know, uh, ways of like, from like activism or like, or like position of power for, for women. Um, and that's what I really wanted to do to kind of like find, find my own voice, find our, our own kind of figures and refiguration, uh, because having access to that and being able to imagine something again, beyond the dominant Western figurations really do something else, um, in terms of opening up possibilities in terms of like building platforms and communities around these stories. Um, and, you know, I hope this body of work, She Sees the Unknown, uh, which, as you mentioned, has been very much about research and finding these stories, can do that. And that's also the archive that I'm releasing um, in coming weeks um, is, uh, is part of that, which is to give access to this knowledge in a also protected way. That, I mean, that's another whole set of stories, but yeah. Yeah, I think, Just, yeah, I, oh, go ahead, Tommy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this, this this idea of like owning your owning that knowledge and um, and protecting that knowledge it reminds me of this. It's a really cool thing I think you do. I, I really appreciate um, is that when you are creating works and looking for support, that you're careful that when these things are collected, that they're not finding their way um, into West, Western institutions, and you're really looking towards um, you know making sure that 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 work isn't exploited. The way it has historically um, by these colonialist institutions. So I was wondering, like, maybe if you could speak a little bit more about how you find institutional support that is, you know, more holistic and less kind of like predatory. Yeah, I mean that has been a very complicated long path. You know that, like, from my series material speculation, ISIS series started where I work on reconstructing artifacts that were destroyed by ISIS in 2015 in Iraq. Um, and um, I kind of like after a while started to like think about what do I want to do with these sculptures and what do I want to do with their 3D models? Um, and one of the answers is that, well, I don't want to give them to just like some institution in, in North America or in Europe. Um, I don't want some like private collector to own them. So, you know, I've, I've never like sold any of those sculptures or, or um, I haven't given full access to all the files uh, of the 3D models because I'm waiting for the right, right time where I can like find an institution hopefully in, in, in the Middle East um, or yeah, the right institution that I will feel ethically okay with, with working with in, in that context. Um, another thing has been with in general, thinking about these ideas of digital colonialism, a term that I've developed since 2015, thinking about um, the relationship between these institutions, Western institutions and technology, and uh, what does ownership of digital data mean? And um, what does it mean when we give access? And what kind of access do we give? Uh, or when they have access and they use it as their own individualistic kind of purpose or they make monetary benefit from it and they own the copyright of these like digital data, what does that mean for us, right? Um, and within the archive, I'm also doing the same thing. Where I am, you know, I, I, I thought about it for a long time, which is that should I work with an institution that give that that give access, you know, basically to this archive that will that will be, become the platform for the archive. And I talked to different people and, you know, I decided that I just wanted to actually host it on an individual, like on a, on a, on a website on my own. Um, so the IBM grant that I have right now that I'm working on the archive is for that. Um, and actually, you know, I've come, um, I'm working with Emily Martinez, who I should give a shout out to because she also like worked with me. Uh, she was the person who did all the WebGL and this development and design of the website with She Who Sees the Unknown, the, the piece that I just performed. And we're also working together. Um, she is uh, basically helping me with the development of the website for the archive as well. Um, so one th the idea that I have is to think about it as theirs, right? So if you speak English, you can only have access to a certain part of the website. 
Um, and then if you know Arabic and Farsi, you can basically unlock certain part of the website. Um, and, and, you know, you know, we have to come up with like ways that it can be trans it's not translate translatable. So it's like image based material that you have to type. Um, then that will unlock different parts of the archive that you can have access to. So sort of thinking about open source as something that is not necessarily always good as people might think about, you know, there's always this like fetishization of like open source and access, but really how can we protect knowledge? Um, so I have a whole like tag of for all and then for us. Um, so these two, you know, is something that I've been thinking a lot about. I think that's a really interesting thread between your presentation and Stephanie's before also, because it's really important for Stephanie also to have that ownership and have that autonomy over the data because of the personal nature of it. Um, I think it's really beautiful the way this archive has evolved since we first did She Who Sees the Unknown with Huma in Transfer Gallery all those years ago. And we had this sort of reading room, right, in the front of the gallery and this space for people to actually engage with these research materials. And those were like books off your bookshelf. Like they also had like a very personal sense that these were your materials, that this like kind of practice of research was part of the work in such an uh, an integral way that we we wanted to give space in the gallery and give space to the audience for it. Um, and so it's cool to hear about how you're thinking about translating that into like a, a legacy interaction pattern with these kinds of levels of access um, and ownership around the data. And um, yeah. I'm curious uh, in, in some of your other uh, iterations of the reading room, if you can talk a little bit about the kinds of interactions people had with those materials and how that's sort of also informing your work on the, the digital archive now. Yeah, um, so that, that's a great question because the, the reading room, as you said, started at Transfer Gallery. So we are we were just making like now a full loop back at a lot of things. Um, and when I first presented it, it was like on, a, there was a you know, section with the books and there was a section with like PDF um, files that were like printed um, and then, and uh, there was like a whole section that which was digital images on um, iPads. And so that also kind of kept developing the whole idea of the, uh, the reading room becoming also like a little bit bigger, more comfortable. Um, at the last exhibition that I had a solo show uh, for in, in, um, in Canada um, at McKinsey Art Gallery, we actually, uh, you know, built like a really nice lounge with kind of Persian style carpets and pillows and people could come and hang out. Um, and watching people actually coming through and spending a lot of time on that stuff was really amazing because you you never tell like and, and it really depends where these places are and who, who the audience is but like um i was really surprised to see people like taking pictures and tagging uh, the project and kind of like showing that through the like the month of different exhibitions people actually spend time with the material so whenever also you make work that is very like cultural in culturally perhaps again not familiar to the Western audience in that sense, um, there is always this pressure on you to explain a lot. You know, like I, I feel like um, after a while I started to get like really tired of being that cultural ambassador or like feeling that it is my responsibility to educate, right? Um, one of the jokes that I would make with, you know, at some point with my friends was that, you know, people would be like, oh, have you seen like this TV show from like 90s? And I'm like, no. And they're like, how? Like what? And I'm like, yes, because I didn't grow up in the US. And like the fact that you just assume that it's just, you know, an American TV show, so everyone should know about it. That's just like weird to me. And so I would like tease my friends being like, do you know about blah, blah? Or do you know about this poet, this like Iranian poet? And um, and they're like, no, I'm like, okay, like, well, this person is really important in like the whole Arab world or whatever. Um, so that that like kind of idea of what knowledge is should be known as is known. If you don't know it, then like, you know, maybe there is, you're not up to date with the world or whatever. So I kind of wanted to actually put some some hopefully um, maybe 
um, I don't know, labor that we could share with the audience, but it's not just my job to like teach you about all these things so that you, if you don't know what a jinn is or like what it's influenced in Islam or like whatever, then maybe you won't understand everything fully, but so if you want to, and if you're interested in that, then you have to go and dig into the, to the library, which I, I'm doing also the labor of providing, but then we meet in the middle, hopefully, and that's, that's how I saw it. Um, so as this has developed into the digital archive, um, I, I see that kind of, again, like I want to also like think about, as we talked about it, the protection of this knowledge, because I don't want one of these like gen beautiful illustrations to end up in some shirt somewhere that someone like sells or whatever, without really understanding the context and like not, not respecting or like honoring this culture that I think for a lot of us coming from, uh, these, these cultures in West Asia or South Asia also, um, really kind of you honor them uh for most part you have a relationship with these these things um so that's another reason that i was scared to give it all out um because of that kind of reappropriation and abuse of this kind of material i like that idea of like um you know inviting the audience to also do some of the work and i want to talk a little bit about um the role that activism plays in your practice as well and you know one of the ways that that really manifests itself is in some of these like sort of uh round table or engagement events where you have people like sitting around a circle with you and actually you know performing and thinking through some of these ideas can you talk a little bit about activism in your practice and some of those events yeah so I have been really like thinking about my work really as kind of like art act activism for a long time. I would say like 12, 13 years. I know it's a work that is now like in everyone's bio or whatever, but it's really something that was the reason that made me interested in art as a practice. Um, and also like I, growing up in Iran and kind of like how politics is very like involved in your daily life um you go to any gathering you sit around anything politics is always the conversation it like never fails right in that sense um so it's very embedded in in our daily lives not just as something we speak about but also as something that we live with and um so from the very beginning of my interest to the art art practice was to find ways that i can kind of also um be involved with like political topics um and the more my work grew, the more it, I found it important that it goes just beyond the work itself. Like, okay, making a video that talks about a political topic or like making, um, I don't know, um, sculptural work like material speculation that is directly, you know, using 3D printing as a way to respond to the destruction of these artifacts uh, by ISIS. So going, um, out of these like white walls of the gallery or museum or the art object itself was something that I started to like think about as 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 a thing that was really important to me. But I also don't personally I don't like political work that is like too also dry. Um, I I feel like for me it has to be have this like combination of poetics and activism and the narrative and you know layers. Um, so thinking about events, organizing, community building, uh, the reading room, um, all that stuff was something that became important. I, lecturing, even like talking about things, you know, when I started like writing and talking about digital colonialism, I mean, I've talked about it in like probably more than 100 universities and institutions in, in, in the last years, in the last like uh, five years. And, you know, I always like see, especially with students like that, this like, bulb kind of lights on in their head where like they're like oh well I had never thought about this oh well like now I can go and, and research this or like whatever so I kind of feel like I also think about my work in that sense where that is my teaching like I'm not right now teaching at university but that is how I think about the teaching a part of my practice which is also an extension of the, the activism work that I want to do to bring awareness to help students and and in general the audience to ask difficult questions especially when it comes to technology um because i feel like it's a space that is still so very much uh there are so many blurry lines and there's so much stuff that haven't been written about 
uh, like only recently they're like lawyers that are writing and kind of like trying to discuss and come up with solutions for digital ownership of a 3D scan data. Like that's a whole new world that we didn't have to deal with in a similar way like eight years ago, right? Um, so as these new technologies come to our lives and then as these new technologies, as also Stephanie mentioned, gets used by these bigger um, institutions and as these, uh, you know, tech uh, companies, um, I think it also becomes more complex and more important for us as like artists to find ways that we um, try to intervene and interrupt these things and like you know if you're giving lectures or teaching classes or have any kind of involvement with the younger generation trying to kind of like help guide them or like show them or like make something that is invisible visible to them um, for um, rethinking or like exploring these ideas. That's something I, I was kind of curious about. Um, was you're kind of consistently at the at the forefront of these technologies that people are using for art, you know, especially with you know three D printing and additive additive manufacturing. Um, you, uh, we talked about this a little bit with with Stephanie, and you know, um, this the this idea that that you're you're often like the producer director and you're working with um crafts people that are helping produce your work um there seems to be like a lot of like talk about or like discussion in your work about or like activism uh in and around kind of colonial politics um there and and it, and it seems like technology is like such a huge part of of the work how do you see that kind of like technology specifically like fitting into like your colonialist like activism politics i mean um i think i would say like the immediate answer is like by by not just use it in a way that i'm told i should use it you know i i did a residency for one year right here in, in the bay area where i am right now uh in 2015 um at autodesk which is you know this huge company some of you who are listening might know about it but who has created software like autocad which is for ar architecture mostly or like 3d simulation or like maya um uh and fusion many other software right so i was at this super like tech heavy space i mean it was beautiful and it's like most access i've ever had in my life to any kind of technology and a staff that was like just ready to help um but it was constantly like a like weird clash of um high tech of all right like i have access to everything i can make everything and then these confused like people who were like what are you doing like we don't understand what are you like working on like what is this thing or like why are you 3d printing so why are you not you know i don't know cnc machining it like what does this mean so um that was like a really eye-opening moment for me for my practice because prior to that i had never been into like a super like tech heavy you know silicon valley style space um and to to be there and then to we had like weekly it was a residency program uh, an artist residency program within that institution and we had like weekly sessions where like unlike summer like i beam we were like really critically talking about stuff you know some guy would be like oh i'm 3d printing a shoe or like you know the other person was like i don't know building a chair or something so it's like it was really hard to kind of be in that space and then talk about a work like material speculation which is like very loaded politically and then i was like thinking about the poetics of it why i'm 3d printing it in resin with a memory card inserted and you know all these complications to it and not finding that that space at all like a critical feedback space um and then right after that coming to somewhere like ibeam which was amazing in sense of that access to my colleagues and staff members and and, and people who were there that like really understood technology critically um obviously they didn't have the million dollars 3d printers there so it's always that like weird you know kind of either either or it's like rarely institutions unfortunately have the two because of just how hard it is to survive in new york with all this politics stuff 
Um, anyway, so I think uh, for me, it's kind of been uh, also like a learning path of how do you maneuver these spaces. Um, I obviously want to like use the funding and money of some of these institutions to make work that I want to work. Like I don't want to necessarily just like shy away from it and be like, oh, I don't want a residency at Autodesk because they also have a history of, you know, simulating uh, weapons and things for the military, right? And then that's real. Um, and so, yeah, that's always a complicated thing. You just have to make a lot of decisions and sometimes saying no makes a lot of sense. And sometimes saying yes, but make sense. So it's always a that back and forth. Yeah, there, there's this interesting like subversive thing that happens when you're um, in dialogue with these companies, specifically in your work, because, you know, as you, as you mentioned, like why make something out of resin that's derived from plastics that are derived from oil that, you know, um, are in, you know, which is a material that is obviously in conversation with Middle Eastern politics and um, just a whole, yeah, history of violence and bad stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, before we're almost at our time, we have just a few minutes left, but before we go, I'd love to just take one question from the audience. Um, so Chris Coleman is wondering what the advantages and context are when you're doing the performance with your website versus just having the website as the sole way of seeing the work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've thought about kind of like, what does it mean to activate a space like a website? Obviously like an audience member goes and does their own thing, but um, I also, some of you again here might know that I come from a creative writing background and that's always been like really important and uh, kind of present in my work in different videos and VR work that I've made and in this case like a web art piece. Um, and I've always loved just reading, you know, like when you go to like a poetry reading and um, you know, it's like, okay, why a poet comes and like read the poet when I can just read it. So I think it's, it's, it does, it's for me important to kind of like find ways that I can like activate that space uh, um, beyond just like an audience member being there and like clicking through this stuff. And again, this story is like super personal. So um, for me to perform it also like feels like, uh, an important part of the part of the project um and so yeah i've been kind of like developing the performance slowly uh, and doing it this last time at gray area was actually um very empowering nice it was really special that we have that performance from you thank you so much and yeah it's like uh, all the figures extend through all of these mediums also right like it's it's a it's a 3D printed sculpture. It has a sculptural installation. In the case of the laughing snake, it involves these mirrors, or it's a whole immersive experience when you see this work. And so it's one of the many kind of ways that it presents um, as a, as a whole piece. Um, cool. Well, um, Tommy, do you have any last questions for Morrison? Or should we head on over to the lounge? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Morrison. Um... Yeah, I'll see you, see you in the lounge. In the yeah, lounge. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up now. Um, we're gonna jump into the lounges and continue the conversation there. For those of you just joining us today, it's a fluid space and it's just for you to explore new connections. So when you get in, it's just like entering a room full of people. You'll see a number of conversations and you can join in or listen in. We're gonna all be over there. So feel free to hop in and chat um, and yeah, share some of your key takeaways from these talks and let's keep the conversation going and we'll be back in an hour with Amelia Winger Bearskin. So thank you, Morishin. Thank, thank you all. It was such a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thanks. Great area. I love you all. Thank you.